Hello everyone, I'm Katie Derham and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event which is part of the Sotheby's Art Voices series organised in partnership with Intelligence Squared. Now today we're going to be exploring the interconnectedness of art and music and the way artists and composers have been inspired by each other over time. For example, it is worth noting that both Chopin and Whistler called their works nocturnes. Paul Klee drew inspiration from Bach's choral works for his abstract painting, Polyphony, and that one of Pete Mondrian's best known works is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. Well, to unpack this fascinating topic, I'm delighted to welcome three really fabulous <clears throat> guests to uh, discuss all of this, all of them inspired in their own way by both art and music. Joining us from London, we've got Helena Newman. Uh, lovely to see you, Helena, Chairman of Sotheby's, of course, Sotheby's Europe and worldwide Head of Impressionist and Modern Art. Welcome. Hello. Also in London, we have Idris Khan. He is an artist who works across different media, including sculpture, painting, and photography. And he draws his inspiration from the history of art and music, as well as key philosophical and theological texts. Hello, Idris. Hello, Katie. And uh, in Madrid, we've got James Rhodes, concert pianist, television and radio broadcaster, and author whose latest book is James Rhodes' Playlist to the Rebels and Revolutionaries of sound. Great to see you. Very glad you're sitting at your piano. Hello. Me too. Good evening. Let us set the scene a little. I want to find out a bit about our panellists' backgrounds and why they're so interested in talking about this subject today. And Helena, I'm going to turn to you first. How did music come to be such an important part of your life? We know about the art, after all. Well, I grew up in a very musical household. Uh, my mother was a concert pianist. Uh, my father, who came from Vienna, was a passionate violinist and viola player and the whole family played so this was sort of a family of musical soirees and I played the violin and the viola so it was a big big part of my life and um, you know when I went into the art world straight from university um, I was actually you know I counted myself incredibly lucky that I was able in a way to you know bring the musical part of my life with me to my appreciation of art, kind of balance these two worlds. And actually this, this subject that we're discussing right now today is very, very dear to my heart, actually, is, is the link between the two art forms. So I'm very happy to be here talking about that. And I have a, a musical family now. My husband's um, a violinist who plays in the Allegri String Quartet and both our children, Max and Bella, play. So we're a kind of family quartet at home when I'm not dealing in the art world on the, in the daytime. <laughs> now, Idris, a lot of your work is inspired by music in a, in a very sort of specific fashion, in fact, and we're going to be discussing that a lot more this evening. But tell us how all that began. Why did this interest in music start? Well, yeah, I've been using it in the work really for quite a long time, probably since 2004, I would say. But I suppose my earliest memory of, and probably my, my most fondest memory is watching my mother at the piano she wasn't such a, a great pianist, but she loved playing, uh, loved playing music, loved, loved being at the piano. And I think that's probably where I saw her the happiest um, in some way. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, she passed away in 2010. But I guess a, a really fond memory is, is all of the um, music sheets all over the floor scattered everywhere. For some reason, I have that in my mind. And, and in a way, in my studio, you can see, I mean, my studio now in London, and, and, and you can see the, all the music sheets on the, on the floor now. So it's kind of this kind of music as memory for me in, in, in some way and, and using it, using it in, in, in that way, I think. Now, James, you're a man who's definitely very happy at the keyboard, like Idris's mother. Uh, you came reasonably late in life to being a concert pianist. I'm fascinated, though, where the interest in art started. Um, it started late as well. I, yeah, I came very late in life to the piano. I, I did a kind of reverse Amy Winehouse. I, I did all the drugs and the bad stuff first, and then I started a career as a musician um, very late in early 30s. Um, and art, I, I never really understood it. I didn't seem to have enough space or intelligence in my mind to, to get the whole art thing until I moved to Madrid, uh, where I lived very close to both the Prado and the Tizen. And I mean, if anyone is slightly indifferent to art or ambivalent or doesn't quite get it, just spend a day in either of those two places and everything changes. Um, and so I, I would wander down there and have a look at these incredible works. And I, I don't, still don't really understand much about it, the technique or the history or the context, but um, it, there's, it's undeniable the, the kind of the emotions that it, it, it 
um, brings up in me. Thank God, because for a while there, I thought I was some kind of sociopath. Um, but no, it does work. <laughs> so, yay. <laughs> well, we're going to be discussing both our own emotional responses to different pieces of work, whether it be art or music, but also talking about how artists have mm. been inspired by those different art forms. And I just want to get a bit specific now, Helena, because I know that you've picked out a few of your favourite pieces mm. of art that have got a very musical sort of interpretation, if you like. And let's talk about the Kandinsky that you can see on the screen now. Well, thank you, Katie. I mean, I think I'd like to start with Kandinsky because I think if there's one pairing that really kind of epitomizes um, the subject of the connectedness between art and music. Um, I would say it's what happened in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century with the chance encounter of Kandinsky and Arnold Schoenberg. And um, this incredible Kandinsky that um, you can see on the screen here is from 1909, it's actually before Kandinsky met Schoenberg. It's just at the cusp of his beginnings towards abstraction. And uh, Kandinsky was a musician himself. He played the cello, he loved music. He um, claimed that he had synesthesia, meaning that he said that uh, colors made sounds. When he looked at color, he heard sounds. So that yellow was like a kind of incredible a blaring orchestral sound, that black was nothingless, that blue had this sort of, like, sort of throbbing uh, spiritual uh, resonance. And so he was very interested in this sort of concept of how sound and color combined. And um, actually this was something that was very much bubbling in a lot of uh, conversations and uh, in the, the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, the symbolists, a lot of the artists and, and musicians were talking about this, you know, drawing on the old Pythagorean concepts of the connectedness between the music of the spheres, sound, color, harmony, and architecture. But it was when Kandinsky went with his friends to a concert in 1911 in Munich that he heard Schoenberg's music for the first time, that he had this kind of breakthrough a pit of a sort of epiphany. And he wrote to Schoenberg and said, I can see that what you're doing with your eternality is what I'm trying to do with my um, compositions. And then they started this sort of incredible, very fruitful friendship. And Schoenberg uh, wrote to Kandinsky and vice versa. And Schoenberg sent his incredible self-portraits, very strong expressionist visions to show. And, um, uh, Kandinsky wrote back, but but that that um, 1913 painting uh, from the Trechtkot for me is just the absolute um, epitome of what Kandinsky is doing with, with sound and color. It's like an explosion, an absolute magnificent giant explosion of sound and um, resonance of color throbbing together. It's a masterpiece, I think. And um, now just on the screen is this um, Bauhaus painting. So coming a little bit later um, from the 20s when um, Kantinsky's kind of distilling a lot of that down into just pure geometric color and form and dynamism. And actually it's uh, great to see that on the screen, um, Idris, with what you're working on now, actually, it seems to have quite a lot of relevance even now. <clears throat> Um, it does, so, it really does. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we'll see that when we look at your work later. Now, I just before we, we, we um, uh, I just wanted to go back a bit. Is that okay, Katie? Of or, course. No, 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 do. I was, I, was, I, was, I was keen I, to talk a little bit more about uh, all the different artists and musicians who were together in that, in that sort of uh, just pre-First World War period that you were discussing. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, th I thought it would be useful just to show a, a couple of the Impressionists because I think there are roots to what I was talking about with Kandinsky and synesthesia and this kind of uh, sharing of musical and and. Uh, ideas around art and abstraction. And I think it starts already in what the Impressionists were doing. And so this beautiful Pissarro that we're actually offering in our auction in Paris at the end of March has got that kind of beginnings of this chromaticism. And I think this search for what the Impressionists called ambiance, this sort of atmosphere, the, 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 the search to try and um, show those kind of moments of softness and lightness and air 
And of course, here with this money um, from the Haystack series, I think you just see that in, in, in a magnificent way. Um, it's sort of throbbing, almost pulsing in a musical way, I find. Um, what is so sort of fascinating, I, I think, Helena, as well, when you talk about Impressionism as a musical movement as well as an artistic movement, is that, as you say, that sense of trying to uh, to, to, to create that atmosphere, whether it's an orchestration, those sort of almost blurred sounds that you get, particularly in the orchestral works of Debussy and Ravel, and then, as you say, the sort of blurred brushwork or the sort of the, the, you know, the sort of the haziness that is so compelling and beautiful and yeah. was so shocking at the time as well. Yes, yes. I mean, this was completely revolutionary. I mean, we're we're so used to these images of money now, but actually, Kandinsky went to an exhibition in Moscow and saw a group of the Haystack um, series and wrote afterwards that initially he couldn't even recognize what they were. He didn't even recognize the form. It was just completely mm. almost abstract to him. And um, so I, I think that's actually a, a, a great example of, of how it starts. And just in the same way that uh, Monet influenced Kandinsky, Kandinsky obviously left an incredible legacy throughout the whole 20th century. And, you know, I think any conversation around art and music would be complete, incomplete if one didn't mention Rothko. I mean, I think one has to bring Rothko into this. Um, he loved music. He was passionate about music. Uh, his son, Christopher, wrote about how his father loved Mozart. And I, I think when you look at a picture like this, you can, you can kind of see that. It's got that kind of, kind of, the kind of, when I think of Mozart, I think of that sort of golden purity of harmony and just golden joy. And, and, and you have that in abundance with Rothko, that sort of pulsating vibration. But also there's something incredibly spiritual and incredibly deep and... So, yeah, you have to look at Rothko when you're talking about music and art. <laughs> I'm fascinated to hear what our other panellists sort of see and hear, if you like, when they look at the pictures that you've chosen, Helena. I mean, James, when you see an Impressionist painting, do you hear the music of Debussy? When you see a Kandinsky, do you hear Schoenberg and atonalism? Or, or is that very a very personal connection for those particular artists? No, God, no. Um, <laughs> but that's, that, that's just me. I, I don't have that switch yet. Um, and I think it's obviously a very personal thing. I mean, clearly, if you listen to Debussy while you're looking at Impressionist paintings, you see the similarities and, and the same with Kandinsky. But what I definitely do get is this idea of kind of being disrupted in whatever art form you choose to be. And, you know, at that time in the 20s and 30s, talking about the, the emancipation of the dissonance and the tyranny of the bar line, one of my favorite phrases, which actually I'm quite sad about. I like the bar line. They keep everything safe and ordered. And um, to kind of rail against that, I, I, I find quite challenging for my own weird reasons. But um, so as there is in art, there is in music. And I, I'm sure it's the same in, with literature, with photography, with, with everything else. There are these great disruptors that, that there are before and after moments with Beethoven, with, with Debussy, with Monet, with Kandinsky and... Um, yeah, there's obviously there there are enormous links in in across different art forms. And and Idris, yeah. I wanted to, I mean James, I want to talk to you more about your particular interest in, in, in Beethoven. But but Idris, before we get there, just do you have a response in that sort of oral way, aural way, uh, to, uh, to the, the the Rothko or the Kandinsky? I think actually, whenever I look at a, a Rothko, I actually do think of bar lines. To be honest, I think about shifting lines, and I think about also how the colors envelop uh, the the viewer somehow. They sort of, it feels like it's almost, this music is, I think about sound, I think about music as being this sort of huge, giant, engulfing thing that, uh, that engulfs the world in some way. It moves the world, it makes the world shift. And I feel like when you look at a Rothko, those colors are so bold, they're so, I mean, there's so much fluidity to it. There's, there's, there's movement to it as well, there's stillness. And I, especially the one that we have in front of us now, um, you know, the way that those those colors hover over each other is so beautiful. It takes you forward, it takes you back, it makes space happen. And I think in some way, it's kind of what music does, does it not? It opens up these sort of, um, I don't know, these, these well, essentially bars or moments between notes or, you know, I always love the rest in music, you know, that, that moment of stillness and then it puts it to play again. And I, I probably think that about Orozco to be honest as well. 
James, you touched on your fascination with Beethoven as a, a revolutionary figure in the history of music. And I know there's a particular artistic pairing that for you works very well. Do tell us more. I think Beethoven was the great um, revolutionary in music, out of all of them. Um, for me, he's my kind of Elvis moment is Beethoven. And w the similarities with Goya are alarming. Um, both of them went deaf at around the same time. Um, Goya sometimes slept under bridges, was homeless. Beethoven was arrested because they thought he was a homeless bum because he just didn't look after himself at all. But most importantly, they both seemed to be completely obsessed. They had this kind of inherent need to tell the, the truth through their art form, um, the ugly truth, the reality of the situation. That My favorite word with Beethoven is, is the kind of interiority, the inner world. And both Goya and Beethoven wanted to do that. So we see the Colossus kind of standing up, scaring the shit out of all the peasants. And Beethoven did the same with his compositions. You know, before him, composers wrote, I mean, obviously incredible music, but they tried to woo their audiences. Beautiful melodies, very... Beethoven just kicked the door down and planted bombs under their seats and was like, you know, here I am, and just exploded the world. And, and he wrote, he wrote to people, not with ego, but he would say things like, there are many princes, many emperors, there, there will only ever be one Beethoven. Like he knew that he was there for a reason. And it's, it's like Saturn, um, this picture too. It's like, there's a harsh reality he brings that is brave and important, and I, I wish there were more of it. There's a nothing comfortable about that picture at all, is there? There really isn't. It's not a happy moment, is it? Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> no, but and, and the same with with so much of Beethoven's music. There are there are moments that just they reach inside you, and um, one of the many reasons music is better than art. Sorry, is that it, is that it goes underneath <laughs> words and and it. And it burrows inside you and it just, it shakes things up in a way that um, I think we need, even if it's uncomfortable. When you're looking at a painting like that, is there a particular piece of Beethoven that you feel reflects that mood, that feeling? Oh, there's so many. Um, there's one, um, there's one piece for me that's just, it just summarizes Beethoven's idea of like, we're all just relentlessly on our way to death. I mean, which is, um, which I mean, it's not, it's not a happy piece, but in Beethoven's hands, it's, it's so mesmerizing. Listen to this, just the opening. You'll all know it. And so extraordinary, and it's just that's why I like bar lines because you know everything where everything's coming, and it, it just keeps driving forward that energy. Yeah. And it's the same yes. with Goya, I suppose. Yeah. There's an energy there, dark energy. Idris, how did that resonate with you? Because I know Beethoven has played a very important part in some of your work as well. Well, it's absolutely beautiful to hear James James play that. Um, but yeah, I, I I made a piece in 2005. It's called um, "Struggling to Hear" after. Beethoven sonatas and um, for me uh, when I use music I use it to sort of in a way transport me to a memory that I had of that particular piece of music 
just as photography does. Photography is a surface you look at and you sort of look through it and, and you, you see the people in the picture and you're reminded of that time. I find music does the similar thing. And, and when I made this work, I think I was just coming out of the Royal College and, you know, I was hanging around with my friend and we were, you know, late nights, whatever. And so listen to this. And I, I probably didn't really listen to that much Beethoven before. And it trapped me and it captured me. And I, I, was, I was immersed immediately in this unbelievable music and sound. And I wanted to make an image of it. And I love making images about, or about the stories of the composers as well. And of course, you know, um, Beethoven was losing his hearing uh, at the time of making his sonatas, I believe. And I sort of wanted to create a, an image that was about the sort of vibrations, if you like, or the fact that, that when the viewer looked at this work, they were almost trying to hear the notes. So as you, I mean, the way I sort of make the works is they're, they're photographed on a copy stand and I keep mo moving. So this is every single page of the sonatas layered on top of each other, superimposed. And it, what it does, it creates a certain density and almost brings a character to the music itself for me. And so I imagine Beethoven, you know, with his ear pressed against the piano, or feeling the vibrations, getting closer and closer. And I wanted to do that to the viewer as well. I wanted them to come into the gallery to see these black notes and really go to it and look for it. And of course, the scale of them is really important as well. Um, uh, you know, looking at Rothko as well, they, they, you know, I talked about enveloping. And I love the way that when you come into the gallery, there's sort of this, these big images that compete with painting. Photography has always seemed to be sort of underneath painting in some way. And when they started to print big photographs, and I love being in dark room printing huge, huge pictures. You know, when you're standing next to one of these pictures, you really feel like you're falling into the music as well. It engulfs you somehow. But what I find so thoroughly exciting about this is you look at your Beethoven work there and it's next to works <clears> featuring <throat> music by Ratmaninoff for example the ones on the screen now and you somehow in the shapes that are created by your process you can you can go into the sound world they do represent very different sound worlds and I mean that almost must have come as a surprise to you did you, you know that you could have that visual representation of a, of, of, of a different sound world from a different composer no, absolutely. And they're all different. And it was, <laughs> which is fascinating. It's mm. not, uh, you know, obviously the, the piece of music is different, but the, the marks made, you know, yeah. my, I see them as I see them as marks are different. And they look, some of them look open, some of them look chaotic. I mean, mm. Rachmaninoff, of course, was huge virtuoso. He loved being chaotic on the piano. And you, you sort of, you know, look at the preludes mm. here. Now you see that sort of energy. Um, and this is, um, this is the Schumann work. Uh, it's called Hearing Voices. And of course, the story of Schumann is so tragic in terms of the way that he, um, I think uh, later in his life, he was going mad. He was hearing voices and eventually he could, I think he committed suicide. And, I, you know, I, I wanted to sort of find the poetry in that somehow. Can I, can I, I mean, the question was, can I show that in a photograph? Can I show that in an image? Can I even compete with music, James? <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, and you know I I, I I don't know whether I have or not, but but I, it, is it is to create a story? It's for the viewer to sort of see the poetry somehow in the chaos, if you like. I don't know. I, you know. I, I'd love to know what do you think of James James of Idris's works because <laughs> I mean, and we're all stuck, we're amongst friends here, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> They're so awesome. I mean, I'm starting to save right now. I, I, it would look so great here. <laughs> I'm serious. The bigger, the better. I have a huge wall. And now we've done this, we can, I can get maybe a 3% discount. <laughs> um, but it is amazing. The great thing, there are two things about this that I'm slightly freaking out about. Um, the first is the Beethoven one in that if you look at the facsimiles of the actual Beethoven manuscripts, if you compare those, say, with Mozart, Mozart was a different kind of genius. The, the, the quickest, as fast as he could write, he would just write. It came from God's mouth to his hand. There are no mistakes, no corrections, no edits, no rework. It's like, it's perfect. Um, how irritating. Beethoven, on the <laughs> other hand, Beethoven, you can see, like, there are times where his pen actually scratches through and breaks through the scores and the errors, and he, like, he sweated blood over every single note and crossed it out in a fury and a mess, just deciphering them. It, it's almost illegible. It's incredible. 
It's and exactly what um, James. Exactly what I was doing in that photograph because you know the density that the that the music has on the surface of the picture. Because you know we're, I'm dealing with a flat surface, if you like, and I'm trying mm. to trying to transport the viewer through that. But with Beethoven, it was so on the surface somehow, and the scratch, the element of it, that feeling, that very fe that very feeling of sort of mm. rub, I don't know mm. aggression somehow, not letting you out. Mm. Yeah. But which is understandable. When you, you talk about the vibration, he had a long copper pole he would put in one end in his mouth and the other on the strings so he could sense the vibrations because, you know, he obviously couldn't hear. And that, he had no choice but to go inside of himself. And the rage and the anger, I mean, it's visceral. Um, Schumann is, an, it's so weird you mentioned, I, I'm learning at the moment, the last piece he ever composed. Um, just after he threw himself in the Rhine and ended up dying alone and miserable in an insane asylum. Um, what is it about musicians? Um, <laughs> and anyway, this piece is called The Ghost Variations. And he said that um, spirits, ghosts, dictated the theme to me, is what he said. And you would think it would be this dark, grim, depressing. And it, I mean, it's the opposite. It's one of the most beautiful you talked about poetry it's like reading his diaries it's so intimate and it's so gentle you feel like it could break at, at any moment and of course he dedicated it to clara who was the love of his life just I, can, I, can i play you the opening just the first few oh, please bars. do please We've got do. time um it's so gorgeous damn um I wish I could write a suicide note like that. Can you imagine? I mean, it's, and it's here forever, forever. And it gets even more beautiful. And this was dictated to him by ghosts. And wow. That's so, that's so amazing. I think that's, uh, I think that's probably my, ne my next piece, but perhaps. Yes. <laughs> I, just, I find it fascinating. Helena, do you have that same feeling that you can, you can, you can hear the music when you look? You, we just heard Schumann, we're looking at, Idris's Schumann work there after Schumann hearing voices. We heard the voices there. I mean, what was your emotional response to that, Helena? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the music is absolutely beautiful, haunting. I mean, it's like a prayer. It's like sort of valedictory prayer. And Idris, your work is incredible. I mean, to me, I think what you've done there with this layering is, in, is amazing because if you think about music, you know, it's, it's unique in the sense that it occupies time time doesn't it you've got to have this temporal space and and i think what you're doing here is you're sort of condensing that and layering it and so it gets more and more intense and more and more layered in order to fit that sort of huge sound cloud into a single single flat space and and that and that sort of um it's throbbing in a way it's impacted so much but it's got that throbbing energy i think it's magnificent it's stunning exactly you know, it is yeah. that sort of compression yeah. of time yeah. somehow yeah. yeah now the next image got of yours Idris, i think it couldn't be more different and, and yet at the same time when you hear who the composer is <laughs> yes it's philip glass this is philip, philip, <laughs> philip glass um yeah. and it's and it's his piece contrary motion and as you can see you know it looks like a sort of you know minimal a minimal painting um you know i photographed it in lines and then i kept layering it layering it because there's so many well not many subtle shifts in the music it's repetitive it's repeated it's 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 a repetition essentially in the in in the sound and 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 it, it you can see it you know it's just one loop it looks like you know one loop essentially and it's just so minimal and clean it feels like an agnes martin painting perhaps as well um who, who's a massive inspiration uh, inspiration to me um but yeah it's it's it has a sort of element of uh, stillness now, Messia has a lot of uh, a lot of resonance with you, and I know we're going to see um, two different works inspired by Messia next. Tell us a little bit why his work speaks to you so much, Idris. 
Well, I was introduced to him by my wife, actually. Um, and um, you know, I, I had a Muslim background, uh, grew up as a Muslim, and my wife is, is Jewish. And, you know, combining these two cultures um, can be tricky sometimes. Um, but um, for, she introduced me to Livia Messiaen, and, and it's such a beautiful and, and, and her, uh, horrific story as well. He was in a concentration camp in 1942, and he created a, a, a work called The Quartet for the End of Time. And um, I love the story, uh, and, and, and going back to sort of why I use music, you know, we talked about self, we talked about sort of the, the, the poetry and, 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 and using music to sort of, um, in a way, uh, come to the forefront of, the, of a photograph, but also in a sculptural way, because I made a sculpture at the same time with the, with the same score um, called Quartet for the End of Time, um, which is four pieces of steel rusted up against each other. And it, the story of him being uh, being in the camp, and he actually performed it in the camp as well. Um, I imagine him not having any paper or pens for some reason. I, I imagine that <clears throat> if you're going to if you're going to make write the music, you know, scratch it onto the surface of the wall in a way. And I, there was something really moving to me about that. This sort of again scratching element, uh, uh, removing a surface, or or sitting there writing music onto a wall. So I rusted steel. Um, for several months uh, on the south coast of England. And then I, um, I sandblasted the musical notes onto the surface of the steel, which is a very aggressive act, actually. And uh, in some way, it's nice to see the sort of the, 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 the element of poetry again in a very hard surface. You know, you have this very delicate touch to the music on the surface, but yet it's on this very raw, this very strong, this very heavy, Steel, so there's almost like this weight of memory, this weight of time somehow, I think captured there. Well, and the aggression that we were talking about with the way Beethoven tried to get the music onto the score, you know, if he could have sandblasted yeah. it, he probably would have done, right? Probably would have, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe he would have, absolutely. In terms of uh, music made physical in the form of sculpture, tell us about this work we're looking at now. Yeah, this this is called Untitled, but um, it's it's based on a, an opera uh, by uh, Steve Wright called The Cave, and um, uh, it, it's an opera uh, based on the Cave of Patriarchs in Hebron in in Palestine, and it's where both um, it's where Abraham and Sarah are buried, and it's a sacred place where Jews and Muslims both go to worship at the same time, and I found it very fascinating and it's you know, again bringing both cultures together in my family. And I built this wall in the center of a park in, uh, in Holland, in Tilburg in Holland. And on the one side was the answers to, well, the, the, the words in the opera, which is basically, who is Abraham to you or the story of Abraham. And then the notation on the other side is the music in the opera as well. So again, it's this sort of strong physical block of, uh, of time, essentially, in the center of this park. And if you come across it, then you have this sort of lightness, and, but with a heavy subject as well, this heavy combination of both cultures coming together. Does time stand still for you when you're playing, James? Um, on a good day, yeah. Uh, I mean, it really, that's why I do it. <laughs> if I'm honest with you, it's it's the best thing ever. I mean, obviously, when I'm studying, when I'm practicing, no, God, I wish, but no, it's brutal and it's horrible. And but then suddenly, it's an amazing thing. You know, you go to a music store and you buy. Any other musicians will know what this looks like—a Henley <laughs> version—and um, you come home with a pencil and a metronome and you spend hours and hours and weeks and months memorizing and learning and slowly and then you walk out on stage um, if you're very lucky in front of a couple of thousand people and the lights go down and you play it and you, everything just disappears. Um, Lorca, um, who I've become a huge fan of since I've moved to Spain because otherwise they send you out of the country um, <laughs> and I have to be. And he wrote a whole essay about something called Duende I, which you can't really translate, but I, I think the closest we would get is flow, which is a horrible word. Um, it's kind of very Islington word. Um, sorry, Adrian. Uh, where, you know, where, where you are so engrossed in that kind of or mindfulness, another awful word, where time just disappears. <laughs> and it, can, it could be 30 seconds or it could be 30 minutes. You have no idea. And so, yeah, the best concerts are the ones where I sit down at the piano, I start playing. <clears throat> And then suddenly it, it's done and, and hopefully people are clapping and I get to go out and have a hamburger afterwards. And, but it's that moment, it, it's kind of, I didn't know I needed it until I started to do it, um, which is one of the reasons I'm, I'm a big fan of anything creative, um, most particularly in schools, because I think if you're, 
if you learn when you're young, and sadly, we're at a time in the world, throughout the world, where unless you have money, this isn't going to happen. If you are able to learn an instrument and listen to an orchestra, learn about Bach, not because Bach is better than anyone else, but because there's a line from Bach all the way to Rosalia. Um, and it's so important to understand that and, and, and to see the connections between that. If you don't have that experience, there is an entire generation of kids leaving school now who are being deprived of that. And it's something to our collective shame, we should all feel, I mean, furious about and not let them get away with is just my two cents worth. So I'm getting a not, bit Not at all, no. I, 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 I kind of figure you're probably preaching to the choir, certainly with these... <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, with those on this discussion, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean... You hear me, Boris? <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's watching. Um, Idris, we're looking at this wonderful yeah. Calm uh, But A Wall piece. Uh, yes. The first piece with colour that we've seen of yours so far, apart from what's sitting behind you in your studio right now. Yeah, no, it's a more recent work, um, but it's it's fascinating to you know hearing James talk about this uh, this moment before he goes on stage and performs, and it's kind of something in the title there. The calm is is but a wall, and it's it's almost like this 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 for me suddenly using blue. There's a certain calmness uh, to blue, and, and you know I was I was sort of trapped in black and white for a long time, and and then I start slowly sort of getting into color, and blue was the first sort of vehicle out of that black and white, if you like. And um and what I do, and it's it's funny, you know, you have music. You know, I, I'm not a musician, but I I hold music <laughs> dear, dear to me here as well. Uh, and and you know, I, I I use sheet music all the time, and and for this one, I started to dye the 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 sheet music and layer it as well. So then I put the the, the paper in a bath of watercolor and, and and watch it take on the, the color of blue. And I, I swear, suddenly I was almost transported to sort of feel that the music was suddenly becoming, it's weird to say, but more more mine. From the moment it was like sheet music, then it becomes color, then it becomes, can then the notes become mine? So I don't actually give the, the, the music away in this title, but I, I sort of say, well, it's it's becoming, in the process, it starts to become more abstract, but it no longer needs the title of the musician itself. The notes are just drawn away and they become my own, if you like. So it's starting to, I don't know, and, a little more abstract perhaps. And, and, and oh, going back, really. yes, yes, going back mm. to what you were saying about uh, Rothko and the synesthesia and, and so on earlier. Yes, well, no, but I mean, I love that blue and I think a lot mm. of artists love that blue. I mean, I think, you know, whether it's Chagall or Kandinsky or, or Yves Klein or, or Rothko, of course, it's that kind of, it's the most sort of um, spiritual color, I think. It's beautiful, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I think it has that moment of like yeah. when, when, when uh, I don't know, a certain type of calmness. Perhaps you bring your yeah. own emotions to it. Are you mm. happy? Are you sad? It doesn't. It brings yeah. it, or you can bring your own things to it. I think. Yeah. From there, we're now looking at your uh, work, which is making silence visual, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the process of this this picture is I had a chalkboard set up in the studio and I'd come in every day um, for a few weeks and I'd, I'd write the title four minutes and 33 seconds, which is, is, is after a John Cage work, which is about silence, essentially, or about stillness, about not hearing the music. When you go and see the musicians on stage, they stand and they freeze. You think you're going to hear something and you're in this moment of stillness. And in a way, I was thinking about it and I was getting really into the titles of artworks. And um, I wanted to know whether I could, whether I could I represent silence in some way by by marks. And I'd come in, I'd walk, you know, draw on the chalkboard, rub it out, photograph that, do that, and then repeat the process every single day. I'd have two and a half thousand pictures, and then I'd put them all together, and that's what you're seeing: this sort of chaos, but calmness, but ghostless traces. Um, and then that sort of led me on to uh, doing a, a work with um, with 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 in the ballet. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about this because we're already bringing together these two wonderful art forms of music and visual arts. But now let's bring in dance as well, which, uh, as many wiser people than me have said, is, is, is music made visible uh, as well. So talk to us about your uh, collaboration with choreographer Wayne McGregor. Um, it was it was such a wonderful thing to be able to do to create a set to to, to actually in some way go beyond the gallery space. Um, you know, with when you when you're on stage and 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 you're working with with sets, you can go bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I can make the music bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the the the, the dancers um, could almost become part of the music in some way, merge them together. Um, on the front, it, um, it's a beautiful piece. It's about it's it's um, based on Vivaldi's Four Seasons, Max Richter's amazing recomposition of them. 
and um, and Wayne brought us all together uh, to create this work. On the front gauze, as you can see, is every single note in the in the Four Seasons, and the back gauze is also every note removed. So the dancers were in the middle of this space of of music and the removal of music, and uh, and it was it was quite a wonderful thing to work on. And this sort of idea of transparency and and fragments and 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 light and movement and. It was just such a wonderful thing to work on. And it must have been thrilling to see that extra dimension to your work and seeing it brought to life and to move in front of you like that. Absolutely. And, you know, and, 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 and feel the seasons as well, in a way, because we, um, <clears throat> Lucy, Lucy Carter was the one amazing li lighting designer in this. And, and she did the most amazing job, you know, merging them all together. So that the fragments of the bodies were becoming the notes and the movement became subtle with the changing of the seasons. It was just such a, a wonderful thing to do. I love that shot just in terms of the way that the scale of the, the music almost like popping out of the, the bodies in some way. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great thing. We've been talking a lot about the emotional response we've all had to music and to, and to art uh, and, and to dance now as well. I, perhaps now more than ever, the emotional impact and the solace that it can offer, Helena, mm. has been front and centre of all our lives who've been, as we've been in our own company so much more than usual over the last year. You've chosen a painting now by Egon Schiele. Um, I mean, this is not a comfortable picture. It's a self-portrait. He was a man who was in, in, in a lot of distress at the time, wasn't he? Yes, I mean, I think we've talked a lot so far about abstraction and bar lines. And, and now I wanted just to shift the focus a bit to, to more about artistic identity. And I think if there's any artist who really epitomizes that for me, it's Egon Schiele. He's such an incredible exponent of the Viennese expressionism of, of that moment at the beginning of the 20th century, that kind of soul searching angst and um, troubled angst and and you know his self-portraits are just phenomenal and here you've got this kind of sort of twisted uh, almost tortured look and um, you know when we're thinking about uh, artists and their identities and certain you know parallels with musicians whether it's Beethoven or or for me also, I think another analogy is, is Shostakovich, I think, is, you know, one of those composers where, you know, you really, you really get a sense of, um, you know, the, 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 the composers struggling with identity and, 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 you know, their own sort of paranoias, paranoia and, you know, just fears, really. And I think we've all been living with a lot of fear, actually, in the last year. So, um that's why I wanted to, you know, bring up Sheila, who tragically actually died, indeed, in the Spanish flu in the pandemic of a uh, hundred years ago. And um, but 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 just because I think there's something that's still very very resonant today with what we're all going through. I know that for you personally, Helena, music was was a huge comfort during the first lockdown to the point where, in fact. Lots of people enjoyed the music you were making with your family. Oh. That's a tremendous oh, shot. Oh, yes. I want to know the dog. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> yes, that's, that's the dog, Georgie. And I have to say, well, we actually, when when the, the first lockdown hit, um, we, we set ourselves the um, goal of playing through every single Beethoven string quartet. We thought we are going to be in this for the long haul. And so every evening um, after my Zoom calls, I'd go up into, well, into this music room and we'd play through... Um, the quartets and and eventually as spring came the windows were opened and the neighbors could hear and eventually they said to us well would it come and play outside and so we did in fact venture outside into you can see us here in front of our front you know in our front garden and um we kind of started playing every week for our neighbors and i have to say it was a really fantastic sense of community and togetherness some of people were you know sitting uh, looking out of their windows and and listening and, you know, just sharing that in moment. And, you know, when we first started, we were playing Mozart and Haydn and Borjak and Beethoven. But then after about uh, six or seven weeks, uh, the family said, uh, let's play Shostakovich. And I said, if we play Shostakovich, they'll call the police. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, they insisted. And so out we went playing Shostakovich fourth quartet, which is, you know, one of the most incredibly 
uh, deep and extraordinary and kind of visceral pieces of music composed in 1949 and it incorporates the, the, the it's got this great moment where he incorporates his Jewish themes and um, it's very much Shostakovich going about as far as he dared at that moment in Stalinist Russia to kind of you know express out loud his fear for his Jewish friends who were being deported and 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 and, and arrested and, and his own fears and and he brings these themes into extraordinary poignancy um in this in this uh, in this quartet and we had our own kind of moment here because I, I did say they would call the police and I have to say, sure enough, we were about halfway through and then what did I see out of the corner of my eye? But a policeman walking up our street, kind of yeah. sort of um, moving on, moving on our neighbours. So um, it was kind of a moment of sheer irony when you think Shostakovich yes. was there, you know, sitting with a um, packed suitcase uh, by his bed every night and, and there we were stopped but but not arrested and uh, actually let to finish the concert and here it is. I think I'm sure Shostakovich would have appreciated the moment. <laughs> I know we can we can hear uh, an excerpt now so let's enjoy it. Alexander Street Quartet playing Shostakovich. Helena, congratulations. What a family. <laughs> I was expecting Georgie the dog to turn the pages at some point. Uh, uh, <laughs> she loves music. She would happily listen to all the Shostakovich quartets. Yes. <laughs> well trained. That's so great. <laughs> no, that was absolutely wonderful to see. I mean, music, I'm sure for you, James, during lockdown was uh, uh, an escape as well, right? It was a double-edged sword, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's always an escape. That's the thing with music for me. I discovered it by accident, um, happily, when I was seven and I, I was a weird kid and I found a cassette tape, um, which is what we used to listen to back in the day, if you're wondering. And, and it had Bach on it and it, it changed everything for me. And of course, in lockdown, I, to, to, I would do anything I could to distract myself from you know, the reality of the situation because, I mean, who wouldn't? And, and so I did practice a little bit too much. Um, and it's it just, I did go a little bit stir crazy, but I mean, the lovely thing um, about social media, in fact, the only lovely thing about social media really is it does give us the opportunity to share things like that on a whim. And you see a, a incredible pianists like Igor Levitt giving, I think he did 52 concerts in 52 consecutive days from his home in Germany, streamed live. and. Um, I'm not brave enough to do that. So I would publish little excerpts on, on my Instagram and videos. And to me, that helps foster a sense of community, which, you know, now more than ever, as we know, is, is, is so important. And it, it created a, a, a sort of a new environment for you, Idris, didn't it, in terms of the way you worked over 2020? No, it did. I mean, you sort of during the fir first lockdown or just just before, you know, that utter panic and 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 fear that was that was coming over all of us uh, right at the right at the start. And you know, my uh, 
my wife said, you know, I think we should we should leave London. We should try and rent something. So we rented somewhere in the English uh, English countryside and got out. And, and all I can remember sort of being panicked. He's like, just grab everything you can from the studio. And I was grabbing all this sheet music and taking it with me. I was like, okay, well, now I've just got this sheet music. Great, what should we do with it? And and I ended up in this this place where actually an artist owned the owned the property, and she had a little shed at the back where it was her her studio. And I'm lucky. And I was like, wow, this is great. I can use this little shed for, to make work. And I started, um, I suppose, seeing it was a really lovely moment because it, we had time to reflect on the seasons. We had time to look. Mm. We, were, we were going through spring. And I feel like the last year has been a moment of reflection in some way and a, a moment where you can actually see the seasons change so much. And, you know, I was frozen, to be honest. I didn't really do that much work. We were, we were, you know, you know, at, knee deep in in in, in homeschool in homeschooling um and i had a very difficult relationship with my printer and and you know it was just it was really stressful i couldn't i couldn't work i couldn't work um i'd go on for these long runs and then i suddenly came up with this idea okay, i'm going to reflect on this time i'm going to reflect on this year um and i created a body of work um for an exhibition that's, that's coming up in a in a month um and it's called the season's turn and, and it's about it's 28 watercolors and in each watercolor uh the the color changes and it's almost a reflection on this last year. If I can possibly um, make something about the, this last year, can it not be in some way joyous? Can it not make the viewer, as they enter the space, walk around this linear uh, line of color and form of changing time? And, and, and this is what I'm trying to sort of mm -hmm. represent and show in these works. The notations, the four seasons, I make these rubber stamps and I stamp onto the watercolor. And each time I'm stamping, it's like this rhythm, if you like, stamping away the next note and that becoming eradicated. And in some way that is a little bit like time. It's like there and it's gone and it's there and it's gone. And it's in that repetition that I find this sort of this beauty in, in, in these new works, I think. And did you find inspiration in listening to that particular work as you were creating your uh, seasons piece? Absolutely, absolutely. Just, yeah, you know, it's, it's, you have to. And you know, there's, there's such an amazing piece of music because you really do feel the seasons. And as, but, but, Back, back to um, you know the earlier question of whether we see color in, in 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 music, and I think perhaps that is probably one of the pieces of music that you do. Um, you you know seeing the seasons change, you have colors in your mind of seasons changing, where it, whether it's you know spring starting, winter getting cold and dark, um, you know autumn those beautiful browns and, and and oranges, and you know I'm trying to reflect that perhaps in 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 these in these in these works. Oh, listen, this has just been a delight from start to finish. The last hour has flown by. I hope people watching agree. Um, I just want to thank you all, to thank Idris and James and Helena, as I'm sure the audience would like to thank them as well, uh, for joining us today. Uh, and I would like to just thank everybody at Intelligence Squared for putting everything together. It's been, uh, as I say, a real pleasure for, from, uh, from the moment we were all asked to take part to the actual final discussion tonight. Um, if you at home would like to know more about Sotheby's upcoming sales and some of the paintings featured in tonight's event, there are two sales taking place on March the 25th. There's uh, Art Impressionniste et Modèle, which will be taking place in Paris at 4pm uh, Paris time. And Modern Renaissance, a cross-category sale, will be in London at five o'clock British time. And if you're in Paris, I've been told, stop by at Sotheby's on the Rue de Faubourg Saint-Honoré for the public exhibition of these works. I really hope we can. I could. I would like nothing more yes. than to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, in London, the exhibition will be virtual. There'll be a 360 experience on Sotheby's website and a streamed gallery tour with art historian James Fox. So that will be well worth tuning in for as well. More information, go to the website or download the Sotheby's app. And I do hope in conclusion, that you've enjoyed watching. Thank you for being with us, and uh, I look forward to the next one.